you seriously want to level up your food photography and your earning potential in 2023, then I'm sharing five powerful strategies with you that not only took my images from average to masterpieces, but also allowed me to work with those higher budget dream clients so that I could start charging multiple thousands instead of just hundreds. Let's jump straight in. So the first strategy that really helped to improve my food photos, speed up my workflow, make me appear and actually be more professional was to shift to tethered shooting. So in case you're not aware, tethering is when you connect a wire from your camera straight to your computer screen so that every time you take a photo, instead of looking at it on a tiny LCD screen, you're actually looking at it on your laptop or desktop. So essentially you're getting a much more magnified view of your final photo in real time. And here's why this is such a game changer for those that are really serious about their food photography. Now, first, it allowed me to become a whole lot more intentional about my composition. So when I take my first photo and it comes up straight away on my screen, I'm able to look at it with a critical eye and decide exactly what I wanna add, what I wanna subtract from my photo, and exactly where in the photo I wanna do this, instead of being just really random about the changes I make. And because I'm so much more intentional with my compositions, with what I'm moving around, my images started to look a lot more put together, a lot more professional, and a lot more original. Tethering also helped to speed up my workflow because of this very first reason, because I was more intentional with my compositions. So instead of taking 100 shots to get that one final shot, I now average between 10 to 20 maximum shots to get that one final shot. So basically, it now takes me a lot less time to get that money shot than it did before. When I'm on a professional shoot with clients, tethering also makes me appear more professional because instead of me and all my clients trying to hover around a tiny four inch screen, I can now ask my clients to look at the final images and to approve these images much faster because they're able to see it much larger and in real time. I'm able to zoom in, I'm able to add creative edits, and when using a program such as Capture One in conjunction with tethering, I'm also able to add so many things into my workflow that not only improve my compositions, improve my final images, but also do all of this so much faster. So for example, when I'm using Live View, this helps the food stylist know exactly where they want to place their props or maybe when I'm using overlays to see where text would be placed, or using the cropping tool to see what my final images would look like in a variety of crops, or even quickly adding a creative edit to my image to give the client an idea of what the creative visual direction can be on the final shot. Honestly, the reasons that I've just given you for tethering are literally just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to be a professional food photographer, or even if you just want to see masses of improvement in your overall food photography, even if it's just for your blog, then I would say that tethering is an absolute must. This has been a game changer for me. It's been a game changer for my students. And I'm just so glad I adopted this really early in my career. And I highly urge you to do just the same. And that's one of the reasons why I teach the ins and outs of tethering in detail, both for Lightroom and Capture One, which is actually my preferred tethering software in my signature course, Food Photography Bootcamp. If there's one thing that I can pinpoint that really takes my students' images from here to here, it's lighting and tethering. Now, the second strategy that can really take your images from average to amazing is artificial lighting. Now, for the longest time, I was under the impression that natural is best when it comes to food photography, that with artificial lighting, my food will never look as good, as natural as it does with daylight. I used to worry that artificial lighting would slow me down because of how technical it is. And I just had like a whole bunch of reasons on why I should not be using artificial lighting in my workflow. And oh my God, how wrong was I? My images improved leaps and bounds when I incorporated artificial lighting into my work. And let me tell you just a few reasons why. Number one, I wasn't racing against the sun. And so I wasn't hurrying through my workflow, whether it was my compositions or my food setting, because I wasn't worried about the sun setting or it getting too dark or just working during daylight hours. And so my work became more intentional because I wasn't worried about how long it was taking me. Secondly, I had a lot more control over my creativity when it came to the styles of lighting once I started using artificial lighting. Now, don't get me wrong. With natural light, yes, you can create dark moody lighting. Yes, you can have that soft airy look. But the one thing that you can't do with natural lighting is create hard light. So here I'm talking about that nice streak of sunny daylight. Unless you have an actual streak of sunshine coming into your studio or your workspace, there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to create hard light with harsh shadows like this unless you're using artificial lighting. And in case you haven't noticed on Instagram and in print magazines, 
magazines. Hard light has been trending for the last couple of years and it's going to continue to do so in 2023 and beyond. So if you want to be incorporating that style of lighting into your portfolio and basically open yourself up to a lot more clients who are asking for the style of lighting, you need to master artificial lighting in order to do this. Even if you have nice bright sunshine coming into your studio, natural light is unpredictable at best. It could be a cloudy day on the day you're shooting for this client. So if you really want to be in control, then mastering artificial lighting is a no brainer. Third, once I started using artificial lighting, my images became a lot sharper. They didn't only look sharper, they were actually sharper. And that's because once you start using something like flash for artificial lighting, you're no longer relying on shutter speed to control your exposure. And therefore you're actually eliminating any blur that could enter your photos. And thus you end up with sharper images. But also because you have so much more control with artificial lighting, with light spill, your images will also be sharper because you're getting a lot less light pollution and a lot less light bouncing off in a million directions than you would do with natural lighting. Fourth, I was actually able to take on a lot more work because now I wasn't racing against the sun. Now I had more creativity to offer my clients, so I was actually attracting a lot more clients than I was before and I could also now take on clients that wanted studio work or wanted their photography done in a studio space or in a restaurant they didn't have windows. I was also able to take on commercial clients who usually work in artificial light conditions. So by taking on a lot more work, by default, I was photographing more and that improved my food photography plain and simple. The more you do something, the better you get at it. Whereas before when I was working with natural light, say I was able to take on five clients a month. Now with artificial lighting, I was able to double that. More work, more money, more practice, better images. So if this is the year that you really want to take your photos to the next level, then artificial lighting is the way to go. Now, before I jump onto the next few strategies on taking your photos from so-so to amazing, I want to tell you about my free masterclass all about how you can master artificial lighting in 30 days or less guaranteed. No matter what your budget is, no matter what the size of your space is, and no matter what your experience is with artificial lighting. So make sure you join my free masterclass where I'll be teaching you all of this, as well as choosing what light is best for you based on what your goals are, what your budget is, what your space looks like. I'll also teach you how to make your images look as natural as possible, as well as the exact steps and formula you need to become an artificial light ninja. So I've linked to that below. Okay, the next strategy that you really need to be incorporating to see massive shifts in your food photography is working on personal projects. So personal projects are a great way to really unleash your creativity because you're no longer bound by mood boards or brand guidelines from a client. So no matter what stage of photography you're you're at, whether you're just a beginner, or maybe you've only been taking photos for your blog, or you're more intermediate, or even advanced when you're working with clients on a regular basis and you're getting paid, you really should be setting time aside into your schedule to work on personal projects. This is where you can really hone in on your vision and just basically go completely wild with your vision and your creativity. So it's personal projects that can really push you out of your comfort zone. It allows you to try new things, but also on a business level, it's actually a great way to get the attention of brands and get new clients as well. Okay, another strategy that really helped me to add some stellar images to my portfolio and to really take my images to that super professional level that I yearned to be at was to start working with food stylists. So for the first part of my career, I usually worked alone, whether it was for a client project or a personal project or for my blog. I would make the mood board, I would buy the ingredients, I would set up my lighting, I would do all the cooking before the actual shoot. I would actually style the food for the shoot, I would work on the compositions. Basically, I was doing everything. I would then also break up my set, clean up my set, and then edit my images. And can I just tell you, it's a heck of a lot of work. I was a jack of all trades, and it actually did get me far. I got my clients through that. I was able to improve my food photography and my styling, but it only got me so far. When I started working with a food stylist, I realized just how much better a stylist is at their job than I could ever be. So I got to work with a whole new range of props, a whole new range of backgrounds that I didn't own. And also I just got to work with somebody who was a master at composing images. So now I can focus on my zone of genius, which was lighting, which was photographing, which was editing on a creative level and then the stylists offered their expertise on things like food styling, propping as well as composing. So when you work with another person this greatly helps you to improve your food photography. If you haven't done so already start sharing your portfolio with other stylists in your area, hit them up on Instagram and start working on personal projects.
projects together. So this is actually building off of strategy number four, which is working on personal projects and then taking it a step further by involving other creatives into the project. So to this day, 13 years in, into my career, I still reach out to food stylists when I have a creative vision or an idea that I want to execute. I ask them if they'd like to work together. And you know what? The majority of the time, the answer has always been yes. Now, on another note, when I'm actually cold pitching clients or even when clients are reaching out to me, I always ask if they'd like to use a stylist for the job because now I know better and I know that the end result will always be better if a food stylist is on my team. Sometimes clients have budgets, sometimes they don't, but offering that option is now a must as part of my workflow. And also a lot of the times new clients don't know that there is such a thing as a food stylist who they can actually have on board as part of the project. Okay, so the next strategy that I have for you, if you want to take your images from here all the way up until here is to start using Capture One as your main program for both tethering as well as editing. Now, I've already covered some of the benefits of using Capture One for tethering over other competitor programs, such as the ability to use live view and overlays, etc. But what about when it comes to the actual editing? Well, Capture One provides a lot more functionality and tools than a program such as Lightroom, so that when you're actually editing your food images, you have complete and full control, especially when it comes to color, which we all know is super important when it comes to food photography. Now, I'm not saying one program is better than another program, but if you're yearning to be a professional food photographer, then I highly recommend trying out Capture One because of all the additional tools that are actually available to you. I find the style of the actual interface as well as the workflow functionality that's in Capture One to be a lot more superior than when it comes to Lightroom. So for example, when using local adjustments, I have a lot more control and I'm actually able to use any tool on a local level than I can when using Lightroom for local adjustments. So this is really important with food photography in particular. I'm also not a huge fan of the Lightroom cataloging system and I much prefer Capture One sessions where everything from one shoot from your actual raw images to your selects to your final images are actually housed into one session. So this style of workflow really suits me a lot more than the cataloging system that's in Lightroom. Additionally, there's also a number of tools that are not available in Lightroom, such as the ability to actually pick any color in your image and then adjust only that. Now, again, this might change with time as Lightroom adds to its program, but for the moment, Capture One is definitely more superior to Lightroom. And then finally, another reason why I love Capture One for the professional food photographer over Lightroom is the ability to actually customize your workspace. So in Capture One, I can actually go in, I can change my whole workspace depending on what my editing workflow is. I could even change it to what it's like in Lightroom, or I can actually customize it based on my needs, which I'm not able to do in Lightroom, when I'm kind of stuck with a default workspace. Now, there are a million other reasons why I prefer Capture One as a professional food photographer, but suffice it to say that you will notice a huge difference in your editing and the overall creativity of your image once you make that switch. Now, so far, we've talked a lot about the strategies that have really helped me to make massive shifts in my food photography, especially to take me from doing food photography as just a hobby to actually making thousands and thousands of dollars. So if you're also looking to do the same, and if you want to take your hobby to a more professional level, then check out this video where I talk about making that exact same transition. And if you got to the end of this video, then I'd love for you to comment down below what new strategy you'll be adding to level up your photos this year. I'll catch you in the next video.